Well, our reading this morning is found in the New Testament letter uh, to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, actually, I think I'll change what's on the screen. We're going to read from verse 1 through to the end of verse 25. So we'll actually read from verse 1 of Ephesians 4 to the end of verse 25. As prisoners for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Amen. Let's pray once again. Heavenly Father, please help us now to understand this passage. And we ask as well that we may apply it through the power of your Holy Spirit that our lives might be changed as a result of hearing your word today. Do protect us this morning from merely an academic treatment of this passage. Do keep us, Father, please, from just being hearers only. But may what we hear from heaven this day so affect our hearts and minds that we will be a changed people and that that change may be exclusively to the glory of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray together. Amen. 
Well, the last verse which I read to you this morning, verse 25 of Ephesians 4 reads, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour, for we are all members of one body. Now, it's my intention to look at this verse, but the more and more I looked at this passage and the more I studied it, the more I realised that there was far more than we could really take in in one message. So what I want to do this morning is really set the scene to take hold of that first word, if you like, in verse 25, the word therefore, because as Paul uses that word, he is reminding us that in response to everything that I have just said, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbour. So this morning, we're really going to look very much at the context here in Ephesians 4, uh, that we might better understand the words in verse 25, which we will unpack in some detail, God willing, next Sunday. Uh, These messages are part of a little series that I'm doing at the moment called Sins of the Tongue. How we speak as Christians matters. The Bible makes this abundantly clear. But of course, the matter of how we speak is always a challenge. If there are things in life that you regret, I'm sure there are things that you have done that you regret, or maybe things that you have failed to do that you regret, but certainly with every one of us, there are things that we have said or failed to have said that we regret. Maybe your most painful regret is to do with something that you said. That is not at all uncommon. We were reminded a few weeks ago in James chapter 3 and verse 6, James writing there about how we speak, even as Christians, he says the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now those words remind us of just how destructive our words can be, even though we are Christians. But it was Jesus, in Mark, recorded in Mark 7, who tells us that the tongue, our words, are actually an expression of what is going on inside of us, in our hearts and in our minds. For there we read, it is from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts. And he lists some of them, and they are dreadful, sexual immorality, theft, Murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Now in the midst of that list is the word slander. And slander was something we looked at the last time we were looking at this series. It's a catch-all phrase. It really is often expressed in scripture as gossip is another way but it's speaking ill of another. And there Jesus in Mark 7 was telling us that he puts it in the same sentence as things like theft, murder, and adultery. And certainly from his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he identifies to us that slander or gossip or aggressive, ungenerous, unmerited words towards another person are in reality tantamount to murder. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. But of course the reality is that these things are very easy for us to do. It is very easy for us to sin with the tongue and it's why it's right that we give careful attention to our lives and to our behaviour and take stock of them. I reminded you that I came across an interesting definition of gossip. Gossip is confessing other people's sins for them. Christians should confess their own sins. And that's true, isn't it? We can be very, very quick to speak about another person's failure, another person's sin. And we can speak about it to others. The In the women's Bible study, I understand the book you're reading has something to the effect that gossip is saying things about someone behind their back that you would never say to their face. Whereas flattery is saying things to someone's face you would never say behind their back. 
We're familiar with these things. This is the kind of world in which we live. And we know from our own hearts and our own behaviour that we are all guilty of these things. But as James says in James 3 verse 10, my brothers, this should not be. There is never a sense in the Christian life when we hear scripture clearly pointing out sins and challenging us to flee from these things, to run from them, that our response should never be that we just kind of shrug our shoulders and say, but that's just how I am. I've always been like this. This is the kind of person that I am. No, instead we need to take ourselves in hand. We need to examine our hearts. And before God, we need to confess our sins and seek the help of his Holy Spirit to live the kind of life that he calls us to. So I want to ask you this morning, how has it been with your heart in the last few weeks as you've been listening to these messages? It is the heart that is the issue. But at the same time, it's legitimate for me to ask you this morning, how has it been with your tongue? Have you been more aware recently? of the destructive way in which you can speak of others or to others? Has there been a sensitivity in your conscience about these things? Well, if there has, thank God for that. For that is the work of his Holy Spirit. And it is a very necessary work. And this morning, we're going to see why, in principle, this sort of challenge to how we speak, We could look at other challenges in Scripture in terms of other aspects of our living, but we're going to be reminded this morning of why this kind of thing is so important from this passage here in Ephesians. You see, these sorts of questions matter. What is a church? Many ways in which we could look at answering that question, but certainly a church gathering is the coming together, a community of people who have been healed and are being healed from the corrosive effects of sin by God's grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ. A church is a community of changed people, changed through faith in Jesus Christ, but as well as that, the church is a community of changing people. That's what God's grace has done to you, hasn't it? It has both changed you and is changing you through the work of his grace, through the scriptures, and by the work of his Holy Spirit. And all the time, this community of changed and changing people, the church, as we grow together, we are being made by God less and less like our old selves and more and more like Jesus. Romans 8, if you remember from a little while ago in our studies in Romans, Romans 8 verse 29 tells us, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. That's the great work of the Holy Spirit once we have come to faith in Jesus Christ. His work is to cause us to be conformed to the likeness of the Son. It's a remarkable thing, isn't it? So a Christian, as they grow, becomes less and less like their old self as they once were, and literally more and more like Christ. So the church, the community of God's people is to be hallmarked by loving God, loving God's people and loving God's world. That is the great work of the Holy Spirit. Now this is important for mission, being a community of God's people who are becoming more and more like Jesus is a very wonderful thing, isn't it? Come to a place where you are encouraged, where people care for you and listen to you. That's wonderful, isn't it? But I wonder if you've realized how important this is in the area of mission, of announcing to the world the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, the Christian community, the church, is ever to be 
a positive challenge to the unbelieving world around us. To put it bluntly to you this morning, the church as community of Christian believers is to be a community that is better than any other community that is found in society and in culture. He turns his phone off. <laughs> it is to be a community of respect that is unique, safety, welcoming, supportive, compassionate and kind. It's wonderfully interesting to say that one historian has commented that the early Christians, the first converts, like these, uh, this letter was written to here in Ephesus, they were living in a very hostile environment, pagan environment. But eventually there would be terrible, terrible persecution and suffering and brutality meted out against Chris Christians by pagan authorities. But it was said of the early Christians this, by one historian. The early Christians learned to outlove, outsuffer, outthink, and outpreach the pagans. It's challenging, isn't it? Are we doing this today? Are we outloving, outsuffering, outthinking, and outpreaching our community around us? Christian communities are to be marked out as being better than any other community on the face of the planet. Churches are to be glorious and special places. The coming together like this, the sharing of our lives together are, is to be unique and glorious. Jesus in Luke 11 is recorded saying, no one lights a lamp and puts it under, in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in may see its light. We are to be a light in our generation. We are. Paul to the Philippians says, Do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. This is how we are to be, like lights in the darkness, attractive, positive, appealing, the kind of people that other people just want to be around. Now, this seems very simple, but of course, the reality today is it has become particularly challenging in our nation, in our culture right now. The tide is turning against Christianity. We are portrayed in the media and in popular culture as being the bigots, the haters, the extremists. And the assumption that many people today have of church is negative and destructive. The meeting or going to a meeting or a community of Christians, a church, why would I want to do that? Churches are dull. The people in there are judgmental. They see themselves as being exclusive. They are unfriendly. They are nosy. They are hypocritical. If you don't realize that this is what people think about the church today, quite frankly, you need to get out more and listen to people. The tragedy is, of course, that this preconception that people often have of church and Christians, in some cases, can be true. So we have to be careful to see that as a church we are growing and nurturing as a people known for love, compassion, welcome and mercy. Now how we talk to one another in the community, the Christian community, then becomes very important. Which is why verse 25 says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, as I indicated right at the beginning, this is our text, uh, and we'll be getting down next week, God willing, to looking very much at how Paul unpacks this in the second part of this chapter. But to really understand this text, we mustn't just take it as there without a reference to the context or the setting in which it is located. And so, as we've acknowledged there, it, our verse in verse 25 begins with that word, therefore. Now, Ephesians 4, the chapter we read, 
Here the emphasis in this chapter is on living together as the people of God. Verse 1, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. This is the sort of thing you're to set your sights on now as you live your life with other believers. Make every effort to be completely humble. That's a tremendously challenging way in which Paul puts that there, isn't it? Completely humble, not just a bit, not when it suits you, not when you want something from someone else, but all the time completely humble, completely gentle, patient, bearing or putting up with one another in love. Verse 3, make every effort, not just a bit, but every effort, all your energy, everything at your disposal, throw it into this great thing. What is it? Keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So there is an appeal for unity. He goes on to write about the appeal for maturity in the faith. And central to all of this appeal is the need to pay attention to how we talk to one another, one another the way in which we use words. Verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Sometimes we are great at speaking the truth, but not always speaking the truth in love. Verse 25, our text, put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You get this sense straight away that here in this chapter, Paul's concern is that the Christian community should be one that is ministering to one another all the time, seeking to be supportive, not dragging one another down, not tripping one another up, but instead working together as a team effectively to support and encourage one another to live a life worthy of the calling they have received. Now this is attractive, isn't it? But this is really very beautiful what Paul has in sight here. But as he writes here, he contrasts two things. And they're really the two big things we're driving at here this morning. The first thing he speaks about is how people who are not Christians live. He's speaking generally about society and culture. And then secondly, he goes on to speak about how Christians live. We come back to the first of those, how folks who are not Christians live. Paul is writing this 2,000 years ago. Pagan uh, Greek and Roman culture is very different from culture today. But the principles he lays down here are very much in operation in our world today. Now, if you look at verse 17, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. This, he's emphatic about this. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now, Paul's use of Gentiles there really is short for unbelievers. Other things Paul has said in Ephesians, he is certainly not suggesting that everything is fine with Jewish people, they too are in need of Christ as much as the Gentiles, but he uses this phrase Gentiles to describe non-Christians, most probably because Ephesus is a Greek culture, and that is the dominant culture outside of the church that's in need of Christ. So how do unbelievers live? How do Gentiles live? Well, whatever it is, verse 17 says, you must no longer live like that. And so if we are to know what we are not to do, we must be very clear on what this means. But he goes on to show us three key things. The first is this, he says in verse 18, the first part about these unbelievers, he says they are darkened in their understanding. Darkened in their understanding. Greek culture prided itself on its ability to think You've heard, haven't you, reference probably to Greek philosophy, understanding about the world, the universe, human beings, nature, 
all of these sorts of things. And ideas abounded in the ancient world and were applauded. To be a philosopher in the ancient world was to be a celebrity. It was to be like a Premier League footballer today. It was, you, were, you were somebody who was uh, treated uh, with great uh, respect, or sometimes not, and some of them came to a sticky end, but that's another story. But there was terrific emphasis in culture on ideas. But, says Paul, as he writes here, they are darkened in their understanding. Sin has corrupted and blinded them to the truth, so that when people speak about their understanding of the world, of life, and death, faith, and all of these things, are, however fascinating those ideas may be, in reality they are false. They have been, they are darkened in their understanding. They live, says Paul, in the futility of their thinking in verse 70. And it is a spiritual darkness. It's a matter of the heart. Paul, in the last part of verse 18, he says it is because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now, this is a big theme in the New Testament. It's one we need to be aware of. That the wisdom of the world is corrupted by sin and ultimately it leads to false conclusions. Paul, when he writes the Corinthians, he says this, for it is written, I, that is God, will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent, I will frustrate. And then he goes on to ask a series of four rhetorical questions. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? But there you have it. There is a conflict between the wisdom of God in the gospel and what is called the wisdom of the world. And Paul goes on to speak about that. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greek looks for, Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. There's the collision. And it is a collision, for he says, that message of Christ crucified becomes a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Now, this is always true of unbelievers. The mind is darkened in its understanding. That means the person who's not a Christian is incapable through their own thinking, through simply their own rationalizing or philosophizing about life, to come to conclusions about themselves and God that are consistent with the wisdom of God as revealed in the gospel. Now, we're not in the same context as Paul, but today, if you look around and you listen to people, you realize that people have all sorts of ideas today about where to find fulfillment, where to find satisfaction that run contrary and against the ideas of the gospel. I mean, the classic ones, they're, so, they're around us all the time. You, you see them in the newspaper, in the TV. It's what drives the plot lines in the dramas that you watch or the books that you read or the conversations that you hear. One of the classic ones is materialism. What is materialism? It's not just having things, but it's the idea that somehow by having things, I will find satisfaction. I will find security. I will find joy in life. And you see it all the time. People pursue. Why do you go to work? Well, it's a means to an end to get money so that I can go on holiday. I can buy these things. I can spend money on my children or my grandchildren or whatever it may be. Pursue my hobby. It's a prevalent philosophy today. It's a prevalent idea. People pursue it. What else is there in life other than possessions and things? Or there's the other idea of life is for pleasure. We call it hedonism. So we live just for fun, just for experiences, just to feel better about ourselves and life. You say, whatever it takes, I'm going to pursue that. It's one of the great beliefs of our day, that all there is to life, ultimately the best things in life are those things that we feel good about. In the area of faith. What drives the great world religions? Apart from Christianity, it's one thing. It is the idea that by how you live, how you operate, 
whether in a religious context or in a secular context, that somehow by your efforts and your commitment, you can somehow find peace with God. It's very, very popular. It's popular in Welsh chapels, as it is in Hindu temples and uh, Muslim places of worship. All over the world is the same thing. It's the idea that somehow by the way in which I live and the effort that I make, somehow I can please God. Well, these things are the result of being darkened in the understanding. These are the ideas that the ungodly mind comes up with. These are the ideas that the mind that knows nothing of the work of the Holy Spirit will come up with. These are the great conclusions of humanity. And perhaps in our generation, increasingly more, the most popular conclusion is the most dreadful and dehumanizing of all, that there is no God. It's dreadful, isn't it? It's what it means to be an unbeliever, trapped in the darkness of their understanding. Your friends are like this, your neighbours are like this. You go, you go along to church, you, you say you're a Christian, you read the Bible, you pray, you've got your beliefs, I'm pleased for you, but, you know, at the end of the day, the world in which we live is agreed. Life is just about things and pleasure and doing your best. But the second thing Paul identifies here is in terms of how unbelievers live. He says it's also in verse 18, and it's very damning, isn't it? They are separated from the life of God. For all the talk about spirituality and pagan faith, the reality is brutal. They are actually separated from the life of God. This is the reality of anyone who's not a Christian. If you this morning here are not yet a Christian, this is true of you. You may know an awful lot about Welsh chapel culture and history and the Bible and hymns, but the reality is if you're not a Christian, you are separated from the life of God. great thing that the Christian has is life. And that life has been given them by God through his Holy Spirit. It's the reason we can speak about the community of the church being a people who are changed and are changing. What drives that change? It's the life of God. But the unbeliever knows nothing of this. They are separated from the life of God. Oh, they may talk a lot about faith. I have many friends who are not Christians who talk a lot about faith to me. Some of them go to parts of the world simply to observe other faiths. I have a friend like this who will speak to me at great length about faith. But in reality, he is separated from the life of God at the moment. There is ignorance towards the life of God. And there is a hardening of the heart towards the life of God. It was true of unbelievers in Paul's day 2,000 years ago. It's true today. Why do people pursue a materialistic lifestyle? Why do people pursue a pleasure-seeking approach to life? It's this desperate reaching out, isn't it? For more, for some traction on the issue of there must be more to life than this. It's the longing for spiritual reality. Why do people create idols out of experiences and sacrifice time and effort and even family in the pursuit of leisure or hobby or whatever it may be? Because they are seeking in that particular idol spiritual satisfaction. Separated from the life of God. And then thirdly and very quickly, Paul says in verse 19, they have lost all sensitivity. And the description in verse 19 is pretty dreadful, isn't it? They have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. This is the great and ugly thing that sin does. Cut off from life in God. Those outside of Jesus Christ look for spiritual fulfillment and satisfaction in all the wrong places. And some of these places, Paul is reminding us here, can be very dark. Every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Do you know, I don't know about you, but I think that phrase describes so well our culture today. People glorying in sin of all sorts of 
manifestations, laughing about it, turning it into entertainment, turning it into, into some kind of aspiration, that when you come of age, of a certain age, then there you go. The brakes are off. You can go at life. You can do what you like. Indulge. The reality is in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Self, greed, power, sex, whatever it may be. There is a lust for these things. Why? Says Paul, they've lost all sensitivity. Well, that's how unbelievers live. It doesn't mean that everybody is as bad as they can be. It doesn't mean that everybody is pursuing these things as aggressively as they can. There is such a thing as God's common grace. But nevertheless, this is the reality of somebody who's not a Christian. And a culture, a community that is not Christian darkened in their understanding, false views about God, separated from the life of God, not knowing the reality of the work of the Spirit and having lost all sensitivity, becoming increasingly more corrupt. Well, isn't it wonderful then you read the words in verse 20? And what a relief they are. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. You have something better. Here is the transformation. Here is the contrast. And it is a contrast. Paul has been looking at the world. Now he begins to look at Christians. He begins to look at the church. Here is a radically different way of living, he says. Here is a radically different way of looking at life. And the difference is that Christians, as he says in verse 20, know Christ. That's a great issue on which the world turns, ultimately. The great issue on the world is, by which the world is divided today is not the issue of poverty, as terrible as that is. Though there are many in poverty who know Christ, thank God. It is that issue, though, of whether we know Christ, on which the world is divided. Jesus spoke about it many times, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the wise and the foolish. And central to knowing Christ, Paul writes in this passage, of two things. Briefly, in verse 21, he says, You heard of him. Surely you heard of him. Knowing Christ, being in Christ, being a Christian, begins with hearing of Christ. What can penetrate the darkness of our understanding as sinners? What can awaken us to the fact that we are separated from the life of God? What can challenge us in our sinful way of living? Well, the answer is, as it has always been, it is the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of of the Holy Spirit. That is the only thing. We need to remember this, don't we? As Christians living in our culture, what are we up against? Oh, you say we're up against people like Dawkins and all the other modern atheists. Or you say we're up against the, the entertainment industry. Or we're up against the drugs culture. Or we, we're up against whatever it may be. No, ultimately we're up against something far worse. Far worse. The impenetrability of the sinful human heart. And there is only one thing that can penetrate that. It is the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's more, you see, even than just the news of the gospel. It must be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul in Romans 10 is a verse I often quote to you. Faith comes through hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. Christ speaking. Word and spirit are in that verse. This is why we need to be reminded as legitimate and necessary and helpful as ministries of mercy are into the community. If they are detached from the work of making the message of Christ known, then they are ultimately a distraction from the clear work of the church. So the world needs to hear, as you needed to hear, that Jesus Christ is the only solution. Why? Because he is God and man. 
The world needs to hear as you needed to hear that Christ has been sent by the Father because the Father loves the world. And he has sent him not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And that Jesus Christ has come specifically to rescue us from the power of sin, which lies within each one of our own hearts. And that by his life, death, and resurrection, he has unleashed power into the cosmos by which boys and girls, men and women, might be rescued. And the world needs to realize that this same Jesus, who has broken the power of sin and death and hell, welcomes all who come to him in faith for forgiveness and new life. So, the Christian community is as it is because we have heard of Christ. And through hearing, we have come to know him. But Paul goes on here and he points to a second thing. And this is so helpful and so powerful. That not only have you heard of him, he says in verse 24. But you were also taught in him. In accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Now the Great Commission makes it clear. We are to make disciples of all nations, not just deciders, but disciples. It is the whole of life. That's why I've been emphasizing with you earlier that Christian community is a community of people who have been changed and are being changed. And here in the second part of verse 21, he says, you are being taught in him. Hearing and believing is just the beginning. We need to be taught in him. This is the work of the church. And in particular, those who've been set apart for this sort of ministry. It's why there were those references early on in the chapter that the ascended Christ has given some, he says in verse 11, to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. How is that done? Central to it is... We all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. You see, as Christians, we need to be taught. And Paul, as he writes here, he says in verse 22, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. You were taught to look back now and assess and understand how you used to be before you came to Christ. And it is with reference to that that Paul makes a striking point. In verse 22 and verse 24, putting the two bits together, he says, Now as a Christian, you have to learn to put off your old self and put on the new self. Put off, put on. Old self, new self. The difference Everything that I was and believed before I came to know Christ. Everything that I am and believe now that I know Christ. Change. Transformation. Growth. Maturity. No longer being infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, cunningness and craftiness of men in deceitful scheming instead speaking the truth in love growing up in Christ who is the head that's what the Christian life's about so let me ask you this morning is it happening to you are you growing or are you one of those Christians who's always looking back at the past saying oh, I remember a time when oh, wasn't it wonderful when all that sort of great to remember those things but we don't live there no there is to be a continual moving forward to growing being made more like Jesus Christ. Our thoughts captivated to his thinking. Our hearts drawn more in line with his heart. And of course central to this is our speech. Which Paul is emphasizing so much here. Growing in the new attitude of mind produces a new way of talking. So in conclusion I want to bring you back to this initial observation that I made. Christian communities 
the gathering of God's people should be places that are unique and different from anywhere else in the world. It's really important that they are. Verse 17, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. And we here in this fellowship, we are to be a unique place because we're a community of people who have put off the old self and who are putting on the new. So how we relate to each other matters. How we talk with each other or about each other should be different to the ways in which people talk with and about each other in the world. And that difference is to be attractive. So that when the world encounters the church, it says not just that these people are different, that they are peculiar, unique, but these are people that I want to be around. Here is a place where I am valued, where I am taken seriously, where I am respected, where I am loved, where I am honored. Life in the new community, the church matters. And central to this, it is to be marked by a new way of speaking. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And God willing, next week, we will begin to see how Paul unpacks that verse in a very particular way. I pray that we take these things to heart. Our world is a dark place. It needs the light of the gospel. It needs Christian communities like ours to be authentic. Authentic in relationship, in word and deed. Places of honesty, places of respect, places of encouragement and support. Because, friends, this is where the gospel takes us. And it is beautiful. And it, it, sh it is to shine as a light in the dark. Are you shining? Are we shining? What are we known for? Well, may God, by his grace and his spirit, enable us to look at our hearts on this matter.